<laughs> okay, let me do this. Okay. Thanks, Maureen. Welcome. I'm Kathleen. And as a whole, we are the Gentle Passage Doula Collective. We're only missing one uh, founding member today, Kathy, who had a previous commitment. And collectively, we have over 80 years of experience in nursing, social work, nutrition, coaching, education, and training. Um, we're a group of committed end-of-life healthcare professionals. We're all certified end-of-life doulas. And our mission and vision really is dedicating um, energy to educate and support people so that we can have more peaceful death experiences and exceptional end-of-life care, supportive and exceptional end-of-life care. And uh, we really want to see an end-of-life death doula in every single um, care facility, and we want it to become a household name. So uh, hospices, palliative care, um, and home care agencies, uh, senior care living facilities, and really imagine a world where um, it wasn't so scary and it wasn't taboo to talk about death and dying. And it wasn't taboo to get your affairs in order and to be thinking about your legacy while you're alive and to be in alignment with your values while you're alive and making sure that it's all lined up in the end too. And so I want to just say that most people who sign up for our training and we've been together um, since before the pandemic, and that's actually when uh, the doula training started to become more widely available. They weren't super popular. A lot of people hadn't heard of an end of life or death doula at the time. And we um, then, just like everybody <laughs> with COVID, we couldn't go anywhere and be bedside. So we took it online. We do a lot of virtual events online. And what we all had in common and what most of our graduates say and people who are interested in the program is they're not quite sure why, but they have a calling or it seems to really fit with, with what they're already doing or they had an in-depth experience for themselves or they're curious for themselves as a caregiver or somebody who, ha who has um, chronic illness. So we have all kinds of people who are interested, but I would say that the most common response is I have a calling. I just know I need to do this. So welcome, happy to have you here. And I'm gonna hand this off to Colleen. Thank you, Kathleen. So my name is Colleen Hughes and I am an end of life doula and a conscious dying educator. I'm also a registered nurse. And when I look at this phrase, which I love by Ram Das, which is misspelled on this slide, it's D-A-S-S. -S. Um, it's, it's a quote that he as a spiritual teacher and he's an author, suggests that the journey of life we're all on is interconnected. We're all interconnected and we support each other along this journey as we navigate our world, our, ourselves through this world. So it's talking about coming home and coming home inside of ourselves and finding our wholeness and our humanity and knowing who we are at the deepest level and most profound levels of our being and building our lives on that foundation. And part of this knowing ourselves at the deep, deepest level as an end of life doula, we have to do some really deep diving into our values and, and what we think about death and our own dying before we really, really can reach out to other people. Uh, many of us, and I've been included in that, even as an RN, we're just snorkeling around, but not really looking in within ourselves. And that is the challenge. So each person I meet is walking each other home. That's how I see people in my life and humanity in general. We are all teachers for each other. And as I look at myself as an infant, 
um, in my parents' arms, uh, I am born, but it also means I will die. You know, the minute we're born, we are dying. And they were walking me home in my early years, just starting me out. So in my adulthood, my father was dying and he wanted to go outside and, and see his garden for the last time, his rose bushes. And um, he, he, as I watched him and supported him through this, he was just gently touching each plant and each flower. And it was like he was saying goodbye. Um, but in essence, he really, he was, I was walking him home, but he was also teaching me something and walking me home. And we fast forward it to five years later, my mother is dying and she's dying in a freestanding hospice. And as she, my sister and I were by her side as she took her last breath and her body afterwards was prepared by the staff. We could stay as long as we wanted with her. There was no rush. And afterwards the staff prepared her body. They put flower petals around it. They put a beautiful quilt over her, but leaving her head uncovered. And um, as my sister and I walked her down the hall, there was electric candlelights illuminating the hallway on both sides. And we were walking her home and she was teaching us about that walk. So we can go to the next slide. So normalizing talk about death and dying, uh, <laughs> my, one of my areas of nursing is psychiatric mental health nursing. The other one is gerontology. And I have to say, um, personally, I think that most people are in therapy, whatever kind of therapy, because they really have an underlying fear of death. In fact, that idea was floated by me by several people along the way in my education. But then you have to feel sorry for death because death, if he's laying on the couch or she, everybody hates me. <laughs> and it's true because in our culture, we tend to turn away from the discussion on death and dying. So it's not, a, others find it not a very safe topic. And yet people who are used to talking about death find it to be a safe topic. And we listen to other, you know, other people's stories. So we all know that we have this fear because none of us have ever done this before. But we're all going to die someday. And um, death is a natural part of life. The birth and death are, are, are like bookends of our life. And so preparing for death can be one of the most healing and affirming acts that we ever do in our lifetime. And there's a story about a nurse who tells this, tell, uh, who tells, she, the nurse tells this story about a woman she saw coming into uh, a treatment for chemotherapy. And the woman did not appear to be aware that she was dying, that she had end of life symptoms. And so this was really perplexing for this nurse who was watching. And she asked her colleague, she says, uh, this woman doesn't even know that she's going to be dying. She has end of life symptoms. And the nurse answered her colleague and she just said, well, we have one doctor who's good at talking with their patients about death and one who isn't. And so with that, she quit nursing shortly afterwards. And she wrote the book of Love Your Life to Death. Next slide, please. So a community, dying is a, a community event, really. It's, it's really not a medical event. Uh, Barbara Carnes, who's a well-known, internationally renowned nurse and a hospice nurse. Uh, she has a big company called BK, Barbara Carnes. She's written many um, pamphlets and books on death and dying that are, are distributed worldwide in doctor's offices, social work, throughout uh, um, hospice, palliative care, uh, even in skilled nursing. 
So her books are everywhere. Her pamphlets are very straightforward, very simple to read. But, you know, she has often said um, and clarified the word dying. She says the body's it's when the body's breathing and function stop. But, you know, up until that moment, that very last breath, before that very last breath, you are living. And when you take that last breath, that is when in our culture we consider it death. So the months and, and weeks before death, the, bod the body is approaching death, but it's not actually dying. And this is where you get uh, your number of your interventions with medicine, you know, and all the healthcare providers involved, all the assistance. But days and hours are really active dying. And death turns into a very communal event. Before that, you can, it is also community, can be very community centered, but you have medical interventions or you have a support system in there. But when the body's actively dying, there's really no room for medicine any longer. And it's really about comfort care. And the end of life doula does this really well. And, she, and he or she can support the families with this. And um, we're really companioning people through this journey. Uh, and we're really knowledgeable about the dying process so we can support the family and explain these things to the family, what it looks like, and kind of address the fears that they may have and support them and neutralize things and also create a space that's more sacred. What the dying person wants, what the family may want to support the dying person with, what does their environment look like, no matter where they're dying, by the way. It doesn't, we all like to die at home, but there's uh, still a, a significant percentage that die in hospitals or long-term care facilities or skilled nursing. And, but you can still create environments for that as well. So the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, the silver tsunami. Well, what is a tsunami anyway? Um, it gives us a, a kind of an imagery of a, a population that's swelling and it has far reaching complications because of this swelling. And uh, COVID has not helped us. It, it, it really changed a lot in our lives. And 76.4% um, million, I believe it is right now, babe, are baby boomers. And I'm in this this category right now. And um, a large number of baby boomers are reaching uh, retirement age. It's also been said that by 2060, many millennials will be approaching retirement. So tsunami means a swelling of any given popul population. And what this has done basically is it's impacted people. A COVID brought about a lot of isolation with people. You know, they had to lock themselves into their homes. And some people who were alone, they found it even more disturbing and isolative. And even in nursing homes and, and other long-term care facilities, people started to feel very isolated. But it's not that we weren't feeling some of that isolation before, but it it made things, it exa it, it, what do I want to say? It exacerbated, it made it worse. And so on top of that, the silver tsunami has brought down, brought about something else, a caregiver, a severe caregiver shortage. Now there's two kinds of caregivers. There's the informal caregiver, which is usually the families and the spouse or the partner and the family members. And I have, in some of my classes I've taught in groups, I have had them come forward and they are stressed to the max. They are looking for support they don't know how to handle all the changes that are going on with their loved one. And then you've got the formal caregivers who are paid care providers and they are caring for people in their homes or in, in a, a, a certain setting like daycare or residential setting facility, long-term care. And what do they have? Well, they have burnout from everything and COVID did not help that. It made it worse. They have little or no professional resources and they have a big financial strain and they have lack of support. And our nation hasn't, they're trying right now 
to address this, even to the point where they're thinking of paying people that are informal caregivers. But I don't think we've even scratched the surface yet on the, the totality of this problem, which really is um, mind boggling at, at best. And just, just so you know, uh, informal or formal caregivers, they, especially both give their hearts. The formal caregivers are trained more for this, but the ones that I have run into and talked with, they really are giving as much as they can give. And some of them are at the point where they're leaving, just like in nursing and, and even in medicine because people are totally crushed by our system. So there's a lot of help to be done in these areas. And doulas do figure into this picture as you'll find out as we go along. So let's turn to the next slide and the role. Okay, I, I said, uh, this is a, a non-medical uh, support supportive uh, system with end of life doulas. I'm a registered nurse. In some ways, this is a downside of things because I remove my, my hat, but at the same time, I am, I'm an end of life doula and I give non-medical care. So what does that mean? That means I don't make nursing assessments. I don't do nursing interventions. Uh, it doesn't matter what your licensure is or your background. But basically, I don't give treatments. I don't do medication. So you might say to yourself, well, what do you do in this case? Well, you know, I think of one client I had, and it was out of state. She was out of state. It was in Arizona. Her father was dying. He, he was uh, had COVID, and they put him into a medically induced coma. And she was recommended uh, I was recommended, she was recommended to contact me as an end-of-life doula to help her through this process while her father was in the ICU. And the first thing she did, because she knew I had a nursing background, was she sent me all his lab results. Well, I did look at him, um, and he was really in bad shape. Just from looking at his his pulmonary values and everything else, I thought, he really isn't going to make it. I'm not the one who says that though, that's not my call. And so when I got back to her, I didn't even mention what she had sent me because that's not my role. So I explained what my role was. And then I asked her this question. I said, do you, have you had a lot of interaction with the team, the medical team? And she said, oh yeah. And I said, what, what did they say? And they said, oh, he's in really bad shape. And so I didn't even have to touch the lab values, but I geared her, I kind of swerved her, empowered her to continue those dialogues with the team. And then I helped her work with her father and a sister who lived in New York that we needed to get into communication. I helped her with that process. And the sister, what this client did is she took a picture of her father to prepare her sister with a face-to-face -face because the sister hadn't really spoken from her heart everything she wanted to say to her dad, even though he couldn't. Well, it, there's a big question. Hearing is the last to go, even in a coma. But uh, but she had done many, many good things in that ICU. She, she had put in family pictures and had soft music playing. She did all the things that doulas encourage families to do and empower people to do. So we're non-medical. We give holistic care because we we look at the whole person. We look at the the emotional part of them, the spiritual, the physical, and we help them with all the options of care that can be done. We help them with pre-planning and the dying process and the after-death care. We're advocates for them, and we're advocates in ways, there's several ways to be an advocate. And one way is by giving them the right resources and putting them on the right track. So you have a lot of contacts in your community that you can refer people to if they have questions about certain treatments or certain approaches to the death and dying. And as a doula, 
I may not, it's not for me to judge anybody's decision making or inquiry. It's for me to give them the information so they can make up their own minds. And hopefully you're dealing with the dying individual before the 11th hour. That's what we prefer. But sometimes we get into the 11th hour and that's when they enter into our, our care. And creating a peaceful process through the whole thing really is about compassion and, and listening very deeply. But it's also about helping the fa family and the, and the dying person. What do they want? What do they want in their environment? Who do they want there? Uh, who shouldn't be there? Because there's a lot of, of, of things that we don't know unless we ask them and find out, you know, what, what is peaceful? Do they need somebody from the church if, if that is their belief system? Or do they need people to come in and do readings for them? What do they need and what do they want? But whatever it is, is creating a very beautiful, sacred environment. And I think I can turn this over to Bonnie. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the qualities and skills of a doula. Colleen did a really nice job of, of um, talking a little bit about the role of the doula. Um, <clears throat> but uh, if you're thinking about this for yourself uh, to become a doula, um, these are some of the traits that would be important for you to have or to develop. And so, um, <clears throat> as we've said in the beginning, most people do this because they're responding to a need. And the, uh, some people have already taken care of someone who's died and maybe it didn't go well. And so they want to make it better for other people. Um, but whatever is the driving force, um, it's good to kind of figure out what that is. We talk about deep listening and it really means getting into, uh, I, I kind of like, kind of call it getting into other people's business, but really um, making, uh, you know, listening real intently and not letting other things kind of enter into it other than focusing on this person. Presence, uh, you need to be willing to be there for the person, um, whether you're vigiling or, um, you know, meeting with them just uh, for an hour or two a day, um, but being fully present with them uh, to help them meet the goals of care that they have established and make sure their wishes and desires are met. Um, certainly compassion is a part of this. Uh, and uh, we have to have compassion for the people that we care for. And then learning what the resources are in, in the community where your client lives it can be really helpful and um, or other resources that you can give for them. So we encourage you to establish some uh, resources in your area. We, we certainly can, we give a lot of resources out to our students uh, so that they have a, a toolbox to start with. Um, but as you get into this work more and more, you will find resources and you will become more resourceful um, depending on the situation that you're dealing with. Next slide, please. So this is what our class covers. These are the main topics and I'm not gonna go through all these with you. I just want you to have them up there so you can kind of read through them. Um, but as we put this program together, um, uh, several of us took more than one doula training program, myself included, and um, they, uh, we felt that uh, some of the content that we that I did in my one of my programs felt a little light, and I felt like there there should be more to it. So the next program I took was a six month program, and it was a wonderful program, but it was way too intense, way too much material. And so what we did when we put our program together was we wanted to put together a program that would teach you what you needed to know to do this work. And then our goal is to add onto that through webinars and coaching. And so um, we give you, these are the things that we feel people need to know about to get started. And then it, um, we get, um, you're gonna hear more about this, but you'll get uh, included in your membership is, uh, and, is some time with us too. And uh, I'm gonna leave that for the, the slide that that comes up on. So next slide, please. 
So our training is practical. Um, it, it's um, very practical, very immersive. Even though it's online, uh, if you're doing the online course, it's the same course that we teach in person. And we've found some creative ways. That's part of being a dually, become creative. We found creative ways to ensure that you have some experiential uh, time as well. Um, most of us have an educator background. Um, I, for example, have been teaching for 15 years at the university level, both uh, at three different universities, Western, uh, UW, and um, Northwest University uh, down in Kirkland. So we have the uh, skill to put together an educational program that, see, that makes sense to us and it's made sense to all the people we've trained so far. We really haven't had any complaints about the, the way our program has been set up. Um, we also do a lot to do community development and because we want this, as we say, death is a community event. And um, so we're, we work to support that. So we develop a community of doulas. So if you do take our program and you come on with us, you're gonna meet a lot of other doulas that have met. Um, Sorry about that. On in our program. And then uh, we support the learning. It's a, it's a supportive learning environment. Uh, we find that our cohorts uh, really get to know each other and uh, work well together. So uh, next slide, I think I'm turning it over to Maureen. That's me. So thanks, uh, Bonnie. So some of the benefits Bonnie's already said that we do bring community connection together. That's really, really important to us that you are not in this alone, that we're there to support you and you're there to support one another. And we do that by um, supporting you through monthly coaching uh, um, with trainers. We do that the first Tuesday of every month. We have monthly training webinars, how Bonnie was saying what is what's you need to know to be a doula and we also supplement that with what is really good to know. So we are always learning and we're always um, wanting to continue to educate you and help you grow in your knowledge. And it helps us grow in our knowledge too. We have a monthly death cafe that we put on the second Friday of every month. Those are free. We've had people from all over the world actually attend. We've been doing those since, um, I want to say this September of 2020 and it's just going strong every month. We have a private Facebook group for our, our graduates to interact with one another. And we, you know, people can ask questions in there. They can put up ideas, but it's a way to connect and stay connected. We, um, We'll be offering, you'll have a year's membership, and a part of that is you get those monthly training webinars um, as part of your membership for that first year. And then after that, it'll be at a discounted rate. And if we do extra training, um, sometimes we'll bring in extra training on top of the monthly webinars and the members always will get a discount. You can get one-on-one -on -one mentoring with a, any of us in the collective, that's at an additional fee, but it will also be a discounted fee. And we also look out for doula opportunities. Someone just reached out, um, gosh, last week, looking for a doula for their for their parent. And so we are we like to put those out to our community um, if we know there's a good fit or someone lives in the area with us all. Well, we are all in the Seattle area. You guys can be from anywhere, but if someone's up near, let's say, Muckleton or Everett in the Seattle community, we can guide them to a doula up there. Or if they're in Arizona, we have um, doulas that have been trained in uh, the Phoenix area, people from different parts of the country. So we're always on the lookout to help support and grow our doulas businesses. So the next steps. Uh, to join our upcoming eight-week training. Register today. We would love to have you join us. Our training begins next Wednesday, January 24th. It's for eight weeks. Um, every Wednesday for eight weeks from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Pacific time. We are signing up today with a discount code uh, to make it $799 instead of our regular $999. Now, I've been away on vacation at a family wedding, and somehow this code is not working. So if you're interested, you can email us, and we'll honor, we'll honor that code. So that's really it. We would, we're going to 
stop sharing now and we're here to answer questions. So bring your questions to us. We're looking forward to, to being a source for you. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Maureen. So what questions might you have? Do you take students from all over the world? Yes, as, as long as they have uh, have training, I mean, uh, Zoom capacity, they can <laughs> attend our training. Yeah, we've, we've actually had uh, requests for doulas up in Canada too, because I think we've had a few um, uh, requests, uh, not many, but uh, it'd be nice to have a doula connected yeah. with us up in Canada. And I know, Judy, you're in Canada. But I'm not far away. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, you're not. Are you just across the border? Up about four hours out of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. I'm up where it's like snowing. Yeah. And 20 oh. below. No? Remember the Alaska freeze? Yes, the yes. The Arctic Clipper <laughs> that's coming down. <laughs> the Arctic Clipper, I like that. Um. If we're not able to take it this January, is there parts of it that if we show, like, I'm really interested in the vigil part and spiritual support. Can you break it into groups and, or not into groups, into segments like that so people can take parts? No. We've not done that yet. Um, yeah, we have we have not done that yet. Uh, it, I, I mean, we... We might discuss that as a group, but we've mm -hmm. it's nobody's ever requested that before that I know of. Do you guys know that? Any, mm -hmm. Anybody else want to? Yeah. No. But we have so, taken some of our modules into home care agencies to to teach their caregivers, caregivers based on specific modules. So we could talk about that. Okay, that will be. Uh, I've done that. That. Oh, I, my other question was sort of like part-time-ish, but it's already part-time being two months, right? Yes. And is that, that $7.99 American? Yes, $7.99 American. Like 55000 Canadian? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, like, how about we sell you some oil? I'm moving um, to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be unhappy with our prime minister. <laughs> so it starts next Wednesday and you want to hear within the next couple of days if we're going to be taking it. Is that correct? Kathleen, I think I have. No, just a minute. You can, um, our email, yeah. info yeah, at gpdulacollective.com. Yeah, and I have someone's phone number. They sent it to me today. So That was probably uh, Kathleen. Yeah, okay. So that's great. Those were some of my questions that I had. So I was just hoping that others would have questions that I could hear the answers to. Um, this is Sherry. And uh, unfortunately, the last five minutes or six minutes or so, I lost everyone. Um, and I was trying to figure out how to get the screen back because I received a phone call and I didn't realize it was going to. Well, it's probably me because. I am just not a techie person. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyhow, um, I'm interested. I My background is, uh, well, I'm a newly retired registered nurse. And so I've done um, almost 40 years of nursing and in um, uh, about a year and a half in hospice. And I've had hospice experiences with um with my daughter um, 21 years ago and then my father about 13 years ago. So I, I love the idea of hospice and it just, um, yeah, it's something that this, I've been wanting to do something related to nursing or medicine uh, since I'm not hands on any longer and I let my license go. Um, and I think this would be a great thing. I'm just trying to kind of figure out how, now um, you were saying, um, and I can't remember, can't remember names and I'm not seeing them right now. 
let's see, Bonnie, I think you were talking last and um, given information that the online course starts this coming next Wednesday, correct? Wednesday, the 24th. Okay. At 5 30 p.m. Pacific time. And so it's going to be, um, we'll be on Zoom and, and it'll be a class classroom. Is it, how long does it go for? 5.30 to? 5.30 to 7.30. Okay. And it's every Wednesday for eight weeks. I think it ends March 13th. Okay. And um, then what is the process or um, y'all say that you're certified um I'm a certified case manager or still on that, but um, I eventually would like to do the certification. So I'm sure you have to have so many hours under your belt or um, you get to take that one. Huh? <laughs> oh, what did you say? Who I said, you Bonnie, you can oh, talk to yeah. us about that one. Okay. Um, and Colleen, jump in if you want to, too. Um, well, um, there's no regulatory requirement in the United States for uh, anybody to go through any specific uh, certification program. What it means when you go through our program is we give you a certificate of completion. Oh, like okay. This program. Um, it, it, throughout the United States, as far as I know, there is no requirement for doulas. It's not a regulated, it's not a regulated thing. Um, the, but the thing that I always, and I think Colleen agrees with me, we always have to say to people who come from a medical background is that this is a non-medical uh, position. So if you right. get in and start offering nursing advice, then mm -hmm. you're out of the scope of practice of a doula. And so, but mm -hmm. doulas have professional organizations. Uh, there's, the na there's the national one and there's an international one as well. And we talk about that in the class. Okay. So, okay. We, uh, we, yeah. Go ahead, Bonnie. Yes. No, I'll, I'll defer to you if you want to add to that. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say that that there we follow and base our curriculum on the standards of practice by the National End of Life Dual Alliance and the International uh, Association, and um, we're we're like has been mentioned before there's three of us here three of us on right now are rns okay mm -hmm. we're we're on the downside of stuff it's a good thing and it's not such a good thing when you're you know non-medical i love it i think it's great and i've worked hospice too and i think it's great and maureen has and uh, she's an oncology nurse and bonnie but anyway um yeah so <laughs> yeah so but um is so the other thing that happens when if you say you decide to have a business or do consulting or something like that, whenever you pull up, it's not yet. It's not federally regulated yet. I predict five years because it's already happening. They're hiring doulas and hospice. They're hiring. Things are changing. Nada just had a speaker who was embedded in a hospice, who was an end of life doula. So it's happening. Okay. Nada is the, one of the national uh, alliances. And so, um, but whenever you can say to somebody, there's, we always coach people when they come to us and how do I know how to pick a doula? It's find out where they went to, find out what their program, did they have a program? What did they learn in that program? Our program is extended. We do eight weeks for you, but then you have these webinars every month. And I think Maureen might've mentioned that and, and you have mentoring and coaching every month. Not all programs do that. Every program is different. Our program, because we come from different programs, some of us the same and some of them different. Many of uh, our five of us have done two programs. Um, uh, we, what do I want to say here? Boy. Um, we, so we have different views. We have different views. We come collaborative with the information, but it's still people want to know. Did, what did you take? What 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 you know? What what was your curriculum? And they base it on that, the certificate of completion, you know. And okay. so we, for us, our program, there are some sort of uh, two of us on this call. Bonnie and I have gone through the Conscious Dying Institute, which was uh, six months, 
you know, and then I spent a year, six more months becoming conscious dying educator, but, but, um, there are other programs. Some programs are just a weekend, et cetera, but you have to look at the curriculum and, um, we've worked really hard. And uh, what I was going to say was, and I know we've talked about this a lot in our collective is that sometimes um, with these programs, you get into the weeds, you get into all this stuff and you have this information, you don't know what to do with it. But we've tried to make our program in such a way that it's basics and you can actually be practical with it and then build on it throughout the year after you take the basics. Okay. So I don't know, you guys, you can add, I just got chatty there. Um, Pauline, then once, once in, we do these eight weeks and how many hours are we to log in before we get i don't know what the next get is like get, to get the certification a, pardon me are, are you talking about getting the certification yeah yeah you don't have to log any hours there's no regulation on that and um for people so judy did you raise your hand that you were a hospice nurse or have you Dental. I was in dental. dental. But, um, you know, a great way to get experience is to volunteer with hospice. Mm -hmm. uh, although being a nurse, it's really hard to step in. Sometimes I think Bonnie and Colleen will agree either the hospice volunteer or the hospice or the doula role in the beginning, because you're so used to having your nursing hat on and taking care of things from the nursing perspective that you really have to step back and say, wait, I'm not here in that role. And I have to be here and be present as a doula or, but a hospice volunteer is a great way to get um, experience. Okay. So you're not requiring any practicum hours. No, no. I mean, that may come, that may come in the future with federal reg regulation, but it is not right now. And like I think Bonnie mentioned and, and Maureen is that we, our students will come to us. We know a lot of doulas. And we have that will will say, you know, I would like to see, do you have a student who would like to work with me? We have one who's a voluntary stopping and eating is her specialty. She works with end of life Washington as well. And when a person can't do death with dignity, they may choose for, uh, voluntary stopping eating and drink, drinking, be said. And we've sent students to her who have actually participated on her team. Now you don't get that shadowing experience with all doulas. It's a very um, delicate situation with families and everything. So it's not the same like in nursing where you can shadow somebody in the hospital or you have your clinicals, but um, it this, this whole movement has grown triple, quadruple, especially since COVID. I think Kathy has the stats on that. There was 200 at one time. In NADA now there's what over 500. I, no, I don't know. It's it's astronomical. The numbers just go. They just go up and up. It's almost Debbie. to the school system. Death What's and that? dying curriculum. You know, six weeks on death and dying, which mm -hmm. I think some people need. I have like, a oh, and we and that's the yeah that's the point. I'm sorry, Maria. You know, but even our medical schools in the U.S. He took a, a dying in America course, and the first week they talked a little bit. They had to write a paper on their experience with death, and then the rest of the time it was bringing in people that were cancer survivors. And um, so he talked to the professor after and said, "I was very disappointed. I came to learn how to approach dying in America." And it, you should read it, but he didn't say this because he's very oh. diplomatic, but you know, he said this was really about talking about people surviving cancer, which is not dying, you know? So anyway, wow. Debbie, did you have a question? I have several questions. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm coming at this from a complete non-medical background. Is, usually you come, <laughs> it's actually sometimes easier to come with a non-medical. Yes. Yes. Right. But my question is, you guys are saying this as experts, but when the families are choosing doulas, what are they generally looking for? Does ha not having that medical background put me in a disadvantage just because they might have a preconception that having an RN is going to give them a little bit more, even if the RNs know that that's not their position and they don't do it? 
the perception of the client, I think, could be different. Uh, no, I would say, Maureen. go ahead, Maureen. You know, the majority of doulas outside of our collective that I've met are non-medical people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm thinking about Bhakti and Crystal and, and some other people that I know, um, but they're non-medical people and they came from a totally non-medical background and they have very um, nice clientele and businesses. Right. Yeah. So you know, what is, the, and Bonnie, you were going to say more. something. Oh yeah. Sorry, Bonnie. I was just going to say as a, as a doula, I, if they know I'm a nurse, I, I make it very clear to them that I can't um, offer advice as a nurse. Um, and But most of the time, if, if it's a somebody I don't know and they don't know me, I don't even tell them that I have a nursing background. Mm -hmm. Because if they do, if I did, they would expect that. Right. Um, yeah. So I just don't even mention it. Uh, and I just function in within the role. So mm -hmm. I, I think in a, in a lot of ways, you have an advantage over those of us that have this medical background because it's so easy for us to slip into that. We have to really mm -hmm. consciously stay away from it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So after the eight weeks, um, it, it's the program is $7.99. And then um, are there, I know you said that there's monthly webinars, but is there anything else that, you know, uh, precept or anything that we need to do, or we'll find that out as we go along in the course? Um, and then, you know, um, getting the, what do I want to say, getting out and getting the experience. So, um, uh, I, I don't know if I'm asking, I know what I want to say. It's kind of what I want to say, but um, I think the best thing is just for me to take the course, see where it leads, and then, you know, ask questions at that time. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think when you, when I start, took my course, I had a vision in mind of what I wanted to do and it never turned out that way at all. I started doing something totally different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I thought I was going to be vigiling at the bedside and doing all this stuff, but it seems like the clients that I'm getting are people that are early on in the disease process. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm doing a lot is physician visits. Uh, going, uh, I, I accompany them on physician visits. I help them prepare for a visit. What do they want to ask the doctor? I go into the visit with them with a notebook and I, they talk to the doctor and all of that. And I'm sitting there taking notes. Um, and then I meet with them afterwards to say, what did you hear the doctor say? I tell them what I heard the doctor say and what their next steps are. And so um, doctors now, especially because they're so strapped for time, are so thankful that people bring someone like a doula with them, uh, someone who can help them interpret and follow up with what their recommendations are. Um, so I do a lot of that right now. Um, and I have the other client I have right now is a person with dementia who family thought he was, you know, really declining, but he's really in the beginning stages of dementia and so I've, and so I meet with them whenever they need me which is not very often right now because I set them up I set them up with some resources and so they're managing right now just fine um, but uh, they'll they'll meet with me whenever they have a, an issue something comes up um, I usually check in with them once a month if I haven't heard from them just to make sure they're doing okay um, things like that so um, um, but I've done vigiling with my own family members because I've lost my, my father, my mother, my brother. Um, so uh, I've done that kind of vigiling, but it's, it's having to take off one hat and putting on another. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit different. So it, it, you don't know where it's going to take you, honestly. Okay. I think it just depends on how you want to reach out into your own community. Mm -hmm. Um, along with that, and thank you for sharing, because, um, you know, doing being a case manager, I attended multiple, multiple medical appointments and did yeah. exactly what you were saying. So um, now is is your position are positions um, voluntary or are they paid positions? 
um, I told we'll learn more about that. Well, you'll learn more. Yeah, you will learn more about it. Um, uh, we I know we have some uh, trainings to just start how to start a business. Uh, we have some of those already done online now, I think they are. And um, so, yes, you will learn more about that. But um, doula should be paid. You should be paid for what you're doing and, unless you decide you want to do it as a volunteer. But uh, most people are just doing it as a as a job, you know, okay. so, and yeah. Yeah, so and all of us, all of us have businesses. All the five oh. of us in this collective have a business. What's the going rate for a doula? Is it hourly, or do they do it by? Would you call it project? Project seems like they're all more. You can set it up any way you want. Um, some people do it hourly, which is I think how a lot of us do it. Or you can sell packages. You can do it by packages. So many hours for this much. Mm -hmm. And the fees go anywhere. Um, so, Sherry, are you in Seattle area? I'm in, um, no, I'm in Southern, I'm in Vancouver, Southern Washington. Okay. Um, you know, so you're right outside of Portland. I yep. think that you have to look at the area in which you live and what the, um, what it would support it. There's anywhere from like, what would you say? Forty dollars an hour to a hundred and fifty, depending on what you do, or two or two hundred, or two hundred, oh depending God. on what wow. you do. Wow! But yeah. it depends on the area. Like in yeah, LA, it it's going to be higher, even higher, I think, than Seattle, for instance. True, true. And it would be higher in Portland Vice here in Vancouver. I mean, I could. Well, yeah, sure. usually I think more in your forty to. I would say forty to maybe. 80 80 for like doula if it's hourly like, if it's hourly assessments can be a little more because you're spending two hours and you're getting information from them mm -hmm. so that can go anywhere from 150 to 200 and advocacy work can be more you know uh, so there's all different price ranges based on and we do do a one of our trainings um is on creating a business and business structure so Debbie, did you say you had more questions? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, once you take on someone, what's the typical uh, weekly hour need? I know it's going to fluctuate with the stage they're in, but just sort of a general idea of what it looks like once you take on a client. Yeah, Kathy is probably our best person to answer that because she's the one who's actually going into people's homes and doing a lot of that. But I know she spends anywhere from maybe going in for an hour to four hour blocks. Yeah. Um, she's done eight hours, but it, that's pretty rare. It's, it's when you get into the vigiling when people are actively dying that sometimes you're going to spend more time mm -hmm. there. Um, and I, the other thing I would just say about uh, vigiling is sometimes doulas um, charge for vigiling as a package thing. So many hours mm -hmm. as a package because it's a lot more intense time right. that you're working. Um, and the, the other thing, and this is the advantage of our, our collective, is that when you know other doulas and you're going to go into what you think is going to be a rough patch for this person, that you're working with and maybe you it's going to take a lot of time to have an, a backup doula that can help you uh, can be really uh, helpful and that's one of the reasons why we formed the collective too uh, initially it was so we could help each other out um, but we also made it now so that we have this doula community and you can do the families frown on that 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 the last um, minute there's this new face in there we try to introduce them along yeah. the way Okay. Like I'm working with someone now that I've brought someone in that I'm introducing along the way yeah. so that okay. they get to know them. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, would you guys say you can also have people support you like virtually? I know that some of us do virtual doula work mm -hmm. and can support the families virtually. So you don't always have to be right there. It could be that you're you're working with them one or two hours a week virtually. And um, one of the goals oftentimes, since vigiling in the end of life is so sacred to 
help the families release you as a doula at that time so they can be there. I know Kathy talks about that to um, have them teach them how to vigil and be there initially, but oftentimes they'll say, okay, thank you. We can handle this now, um, which is actually a compliment that you've done it well so that they feel comfortable and confident. So there's all different ways that it can work. Um, my last question is maybe a bit of an odd one. <laughs> I have a real propensity to tears and crying. Oh, <laughs> sometimes watching a movie, even a touching commercial might do it. My kids just roll their eyes and hand me the box of tissues. <laughs> but certainly when I talk to people with my degree of empathy and compassion, I can feel their pain and the tears just come. I've embraced it. It doesn't bother me at all. I'll just keep having the conversation and know that this is just my expression of my sorrow, of my hurt for them, whatever it is. But is that going to be unnerving for the patient or the families? Do they want to see a tough, strong person there holding things together? Which I can do and I would do but there'll still be tears in the mix. You know, I was given one piece of advice from a mentor, someone who's been in hospice for a long, long time, written books, the whole nine yards. And what she said is you never want to grieve harder than the people who are grieving. Mm -hmm. So it, tears, I have read many stories and books and where, you know, the doula has tears, but it's controlled and they never want to just break down where the person now is in I would reverse the role and they're taking care of the doula. Yeah. So I think that was the best piece of advice I got because I'm a crier. Yeah. But um, there's an, there's something else too. We teach you about a lot of, a lot about communication mm -hmm. and, and a term called holding space. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes if you are, and, and, and I understand where you're coming from, but you know, sometimes you, you can uh, you can be empathic, but at the same time, compassion is really where it it really is super effective. And it's other. It's you are there for them. Mm -hmm. You know, not your. It, as soon as you get wrapped up in what their story is, those tears you might have some, and that I don't think is is bad at all. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that the more you focus on them in your communication and holding that space, that sacred space for them, you are there for them. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a kind yeah. of a, sometimes it's a hard thing to explain, but you have to practice it. So um, I, I think communication is one of the most important things. And what you're saying is, yes, of course, we're all human. As a nurse, I've cried with, with yeah, families. Yeah. But um, I, I think... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm entering into a, con, a full year of consulting uh, program where the person who's doing this is an expert in it. And and they, uh, as much communication skills as I think I have, I find that the doula, being a doula has just opened up some new, new views on things and how to be with people. And it's, mm -hmm. and this whole course is a, this whole consulting thing is about holding space which one would think is very easy but it's not so it, I think your tears will be fine just as long as you don't grieve harder than the people who are grieving. yeah yeah no that's that would be the case and I also know that sometimes like working with my kids through things that you know I'll be crying along with them but I'm still very practical yeah. these are the things where do I'm still got that big picture but yeah and debbie have you met kathy who's one of our doulas i think you have through kathy bates i don't know if you yeah. remember that. yeah she's a crier she's, <laughs> a, crier. she's a crier yeah, yeah. So she, she's, she's, she's probably really a crier. listening to you talk about it yeah kathy you're gonna hear this but we love yeah. her for that yeah. and she's the most compassionate doula i know she's a wonderful person So how um, how do we make the payment? Well, you know, if you are interested, I will have Kathleen 
send you an invoice. Because okay. like I said, I haven't figured out since I've been out of town why our discount code is not working. We've just done some work on our website. But um, I'm going to put our email in here in the in the chat. And um, you can copy it down. And if you send uh, an email saying that you would like to join, Kathleen will get an invoice sent to you. And that'll be um, at the $7.99 rate. Just say that you were on the webinar and you would like to um, to join the training. So it's info at info at GP for gentle passage doula collective.com. And if you do put your name, your email, well, which will be in the thing, but if you could throw your phone number on that email also, that would be great for the invoice. Okay. Um, and so it starts next Wednesday. It'll go from 530 to 730 for the next eight weeks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I don't think there's anything going on. Um, I've had a lot of uh, stuff going on with my mom. She turns 91 in about uh, three weeks. Uh -huh. And so a lot of issues. I've been her primary caregiver, but we've got some care set up for her. So I, um, I finally am getting tired.